I want to introduce Virginia Mahachek. Um, Virginia is um, principal geomorphologist at WRA Incorporated. It's a, a well-known firm here in the Bay Area. Um, Virginia has worked extensively in watersheds throughout California. And I came to know of Virginia when she headed up the County of Sonoma's response after the North Bay fires of 2017. So she has a, a, a firsthand uh, knowledge of the data landscape after a wildfire incident from a lot of different standpoints, not just uh, land management, but also um, uh, social sides and infrastructure. And so uh, many of you on this call um, have experienced that sort of data storm that happens after a, a wildfire incident. So you might see your experience in Virginia's talk, but we're all in for a solid primer on what to expect. And um, Virginia, Virginia is also gonna share some of her ideas for better leveraging um, existing data networks for response and recovery. Um, Virginia's talk is entitled, Real-Time and Early Post-Wildfire Data, Navigating Data Storms. So with that, I wanna introduce Virginia Mahachek. Thank you so much for being here. You bet. It's, it's really fun to see a, a few folks uh... Thanks for the message, Allison. I'm not responding in the chat right this minute, but and it's good to see Bob, et cetera. So um, this is a fun opportunity to kind of uh, look back uh, on uh, some of my experiences around fire data sets. Now, granted, a lot of you have a lot more intimate knowledge with, um, with some of the data sets, but I think I can provide some useful information and and jumpstart maybe some additional efforts of the group. So I guess as a background, I'll say I'm a fluvial geomorphologist. I am neither a firefighter or a fire scientist um, background, but I've spent um, a long career on water resources, watershed work, and primarily river restoration. Work throughout California, a lot in the Sierra, a lot throughout the Columbia River Basin, but I grew up here in Sonoma County. And as Tom mentioned, um, I'm currently a leading both kind of a restoration practice and a resiliency uh, services group at WRA. And I joined that company just like a couple of months before the COVID shutdowns. Prior to that, I had been at the County of Sonoma in that special office that they created after the Tubbs Nuns fires and um, worked with folks there. You could probably relabel this talk as kind of the like primary and secondary data portals and dashboards, oh my, you know, it's kind of uh, that kind of situation that I thought would be fun to talk about. And I do come to this from a combination of personal and professional perspectives. I witnessed the Hanley fire from the same property I'm standing on right now and uh, was very worried about my mom who was out helping um, evacuate livestock from folks up on Calistoga. And that is the perspective that I saw Tubbs fire when I evacuated. I also uh, lived and worked in the Tahoe Basin for 20 years. And my neighborhood is part of the Angora fire. My particular house was fine. Um, and then um, I've had some of the same kind of community layered trauma stuff of COVID experience and the Kincaid evacuations and anxiety and health issues. But I do want to point out that the glass fire brought in another new experience. At Angora, I had helped with post-fire stream assessments because I did stream restoration in Tahoe. But on the glass fire, I had another unique experience, which was that um, we had just finished completing the York Creek dam removal and installing 36 log structures for stream restoration and sediment management benefit. And three days later, that whole project burned. So um, a lot of different exposures. And you know when when we talk about um, recovery from the fires, traditionally wildland fires were occurring um, in properties that had a, a lot of natural resource management or timberland management issues. And some of the frameworks for recovery timelines uh, are based on that. So this is just an example of kind of forest service traditional view of the event, the incident, um, the activities that are happening. Uh, the fixes you need, stabilizing things and restoring. And you also notice this is uh, focused on a timber example um, that includes kind of the windows for appropriate salvage. And the, the time frames and the conditions are kind of unique. Every event has its own geography and its own kind of circumstances. 
what I think might be useful, and I adapted this kind of um, sliding scale, is, is, um, is kind of expressing it more in the, well, unfortunately, more common recent fires that are happening in buoys. They're happening over very large geographies, crossing a lot of different boundaries. And, and what I'm going to touch on that other speakers in the series will talk more about is I'm going to talk a little bit about who are some of the parties involved in the early phases? What are some of the types of data that they're generating, you know, kind of accidentally by the virtue of their operations and some of the data that they need and then um, are creating that can be shared. Now, remember in the emergency, it, it's kind of an all hands on deck in the sense that everybody's being affected, but it's true that certain people and certain entities have particular responsibilities, urgent ones, critical ones. Uh, they're part of incident command. They're, they're part of um, the safety and life preservation of life. So the exact hierarchy of who's collecting data and uh, when it becomes available and what part becomes public uh, does depend on the nature of the incident and who's in charge and whether or not uh, a disaster gets declared. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. The Forest Service nationally is really dominant, but in our part of California, um, really CAL FIRE is usually the, the lead, even if there is joint command. And I purposely want to mention law enforcement because during firefighting, law enforcement is conducting a lot of operations, including those that interact with our agricultural community and working lands kind of issues. So those may or may not become important uh, to your natural resource management. And during the fire, um, the ongoing emergency is really driving the data collection and, and following the priorities of the firefighting needs, right? Um, protecting lives, um, protecting property, and to the degree feasible, defending the natural environment. Now, what that means uh, is open to a lot of interpretation, and particularly in some of our recent wildfire and wild storms, wildfire storms, the fires are just moving at such a pace and over such a geographic scale that life safety is about all they can do, right? And, um, and, and really not even a great job at being able to save property. So, so that, that's just something to keep in mind. But if we look at what kind of data sources and what kind of data parameters are being created as firefighting's going on, I generated this little list, which is examples, but kind of organized in a way to help you see um, options of where you might data mine and also think through, like Tom was mentioning when you're brainstorming, what other kinds of data or players might we want to be um, engaging during this phase to the degree that it's feasible. So federal agencies and federal interagency groups are really dominant in the sense that they're they're generating real-time data through satellite systems, through on-the-ground work, um, and they're trying to support operational decisions. So there's a lot of information being transferred. I've noticed a very big jump in the amount of that information that's publicly available to witness, meaning like during Caldor, the daily briefings information that was publicly available was amazing. Now, if I was a data user, I would want to take the lesson that that's transient. If you think of that as Snapchat, you know, if you think you're going to want any of that, you better copy, download, paste, snip, cut, whatever, because it's not the kind of information that's going to be preserved and shared in a digestible format, right? But there's a lot going on, and it seems like that's changing really rapidly as well. Um, I also, on the bottom of this list, I point out two uh, examples, not the only, but two examples that are non-government, uh, private sector kind of um, resources. Uh, the alert wildfire networks uh, and the flight radar are things that end up being pretty useful if you're trying to pay attention to um, tracking uh, conditions and fire movement uh, from ground-based information in places that are closed that you can't have access to unless you're part of the operations. So I think that's kind of good to think about. Now, this crazy graphic is something that I've been uh, just trying to put together to help feel, people realize that as the fire is raging, 
it's having effects well beyond that human life and then the property concerns that are in that gray box structures and infrastructure. I just decided that I'm calling these realms um, and uh, things are happening in, to the atmosphere. Things are happening to uh, water supply, whether it's natural or developed water supplies, hill slopes, runoff, vegetation's getting changed, right? And these are complex. Uh, they're complex in uh, uh, and overlapping in time scales, geography, direct impacts, secondary impacts. Some of these things are gonna happen instantaneously and go away. Some of these changes are happening over days or weeks or some things are not gonna show up until later. So great, this is not a challenge at all, right? To figure out what to do and what kind of data is available or, or, um, for you. But if I overlay uh, some indication of the kind of parties that are responsible for these realms, you start to see that, um, and this is not exhaustive, I was just trying to pick a few examples of key agencies that have a mission and a responsibility to look for the impacts and the effects. So you've got everything from you know, the county assessors all the way up to academic institutions or flood managers. You, know, you may not think of the flood managers as being tightly connected to the fire data, but they certainly will be as they start to think about secondary hazards, right? So this, um, this is just, I guess, an illustration, uh, but maybe it's also a schematic map of where to search for data sets, right? Um, and now if we go farther into that um, post-fire timeframe, this is an updated kind of list of how the there's a shift of who's in a leadership role, who's creating data or disseminating data, and it's going to really depend on whether the financial and community and human life damages rise to a level that um, induces a disaster declaration. Because you know, Cal OES and FEMA's engagement is gonna depend on what level of disaster declaration occurs. But this example is kind of the, the full Monty where you do have FEMA engagement, but that's through OES in particular, you will have EPA, um, and, but through usually Cal EPA's agencies that are doing hazardous materials removals, debris uh, management, and those kind of measures. And then Cal Fire and, and California Geologic Survey are going to start rolling in to assess like the stability issues for um, hill slopes and start to think about secondary hazards. And I'm pulling up now, you know, Closures are gone, evacuations are lifted, and some of the some of you, open space managers, park districts, maybe conservation um, landowners like Pepperwood or Wildlands Conservancy or others, they can start making proactive efforts at either data collection or recovery. Uh, let's, and then I'm just going to flow just slightly farther down the time scale and say that um, again. This is just to kind of illustrate, see how there's a shift where the federal agencies, they kind of going away, guys. The feds kind of go away and they just become a pocketbook if there is some HMGP money or some you know, post-fire um, monies that you're gonna pursue in the long-term, but it's gonna become more and more local entities responsibilities or partnerships of public and private entities that are gonna be engaged in both data gathering, data analysis, and data sharing. I also think of this um, as a time frame where, yes, recovery and restoration are happening, but research is typically going on, you know, becomes more um, active. And the first two items over here on the parameters, I definitely want to mention those. Uh, if you have forest service lands, if you have federal lands, you're likely to get engagement with um, bearer reports, the burn area emergency response reporting. We don't see that much in our neck of the woods because we don't have much federal land on the coast here. But instead, and, and we're probably, you might be familiar with the uh, uh, WERT, which is the state um, kind of parallel process that is multi-agency evaluation. 
I will say, personal experience and advocacy notwithstanding, you know, that's really still focused on gray infrastructure. Uh, the values at risk are kind of biased towards that and not for green infrastructure. For example, the investment the city of St. Helena made on that York Creek restoration and the burned up log structures, you know, that's not a VAR that was part of what was evaluated in the work after the glass fire. The water tanks themselves and a few other structures were. So, you know, there's certain kinds of data are going to come out of that. The other type of data that I was just going to maybe mention that may or may not seem um, you know, predictable to you is that the debris and hazard tree removal information uh, that's going to come to you through dashboards or uh, like the Cal Recycle and the California Department of to Toxic Substances. Um, and it's going to have inventories about hazard trees and about the plans for removals along roads or um, any other public spaces. So that could be an important uh, resource uh, for different kinds of questions that people might have about, you know, carbon or net, uh, carbon losses or contamination and water quality risks. Uh, let's see, go down, take a slightly different view and look at the geography. Uh, you know, we're from the federal bird's eye view, we're one region. SF Bay Area is kind of all in one district. It's all in one EPA region. It's all in, in a FEMA region. Check, check, not too complicated. But as soon as you get into the state level entities, things get a little confusing and I would say a little bit um, problematic. Um, we are all in the Cal Fire North region, but we're going to be touching potentially at least four Cal Fire units, depending upon the exact boundaries of the fires. Each of those units has different kind of robustness in their planning and ability to communicate and, um, and as you know, and, and different battalion chiefs and, and representatives. The fish and wildlife um, region kind of matches your geography and that's convenient. Um, although there's gonna be a lot of differences in the information available for different watersheds based on like, oh, are there sensitive species? Are there listed species in some and not others? The data sets will differ. I'll use the Mark West Creek as an example. Mark West Creek is a really important fisheries tributary to the Russian River. However, it has almost all private lands all along it. And the pre-fire and post-fire data sets were very challenging um, because, uh, because of that. So, you know, there's like certain kinds of, of agency or academic research that have been done but not a great deal of options. So, so that's, that's one thing. And then you may or may not already have thought about or experienced some of the challenges from the air pollution control districts. That geography comes into play related to pre-fire and prescribed burning. Well, it comes into play related to air quality data and some of those other metrics as well. And the regional water quality control board issues, one of the things I would point out from experience was the North Coast versus the San Francisco Bay Area districts had very different like funding and um, staff time available and resources to do post-fire monitoring and um, disclosure of those data. So that was a challenge. For example, the Nuns Fire was crossing in both of those areas. And, um, and so you had different kinds of public or shareable data. And now I'm going to be... I, I don't want to regret not talking about water a little bit more because that's my fave. And um, I'm just going to comment on a little bit of difference between the federal data sets. There are pretty good federal data sets and you can tap into them through the USGS or through California's state platform and CDEC. But I just want to point these couple of links are now starting to overlay fire data with water data to make it, uh, portals where you can kind of get the data in a connected sense. But I'm showing this partly to indicate there aren't that many dots on the map relative to the size of some of the fires, right? And, um, and you know, the USGS and state DWR for decades has fought to keep their gauges operating 
and keep funding for gauges. And so, you know, in recent years, there has been some gauge abandonment, but there's also been some new local uh, stream networks. The thing I want to say about this is they've been terrific. You know, Sonoma Water just, you know, killed it on getting organized and implementing one rain and, and being part of the alert wildfire camera stuff. But notice that these different counties, some of them are using um, one rain and some of them are using a different kind of system. And a couple of the counties don't really even have a very publicly available um, data um, portal, at least not that I can tell, related to surface water flows, flood stage or water quality or weather data. And, um, and the data that does exist is bound at kind of these ge um, political ge geographies. So I think we have a lot of work to do to kind of take the good um, initial change that's added a lot of local detail to the monitoring network, but help it become more robust and sustainable um, so that we have, these are right now, as we speak, creating pre-fire data for something that has yet to happen. <laughs> and uh, so that's, um, that's kind of how I view it. And one example over in Napa that is kind of distressing related to the glass fire is that the glass fire didn't destroy the gauge, but the, pre the subsequent atmospheric river flooding did destroy one of the gauges, but it, they don't, the flood district doesn't have the money to fix it. So th this information is not yet um, part of a, you know, supported long-term plan. Get off that soapbox. And uh, I want to finish with just something that I'll share and that Tom made me aware today. You guys have started a Google Sheet that this can then contribute to. I've focused just on what I think are some of the cool uh, raw data, primary data kind of sources, and then a few near the bottom that are secondary sources, but pretty darn important. Um, and lastly, I'm going to highlight, I picked one, not picking favorites, I'm picking one I thought you might not already know about, and that's University of Wisconsin-Madison's Space Science and Engineering link. So an example of an academic institution that has uh, both raw data coming through its portal and also some analytics. The one I highlight in the lower left called Bridge is a complement and potentially an update to the USGS Bear um, uh, and Bark burn severity work. So that is um, all I was going to uh, say in the presentation component and open it up for discussion. All right. I can hear the round of applause right now through the ether. <laughs> Thank you so much, Virginia. Sure. I feel like you just um, presented a, uh, a condensed, um, you know, semester long class. Um, I, I, have, I have a few questions myself, but, you know, folks on this call have experienced um, uh, fires, and I really want to get to their questions first. So um, please take yourselves off mute and just um, say your name and your affiliation so Virginia knows. And um, let's have your questions. I've dumbfounded you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a lot to take in for sure. I know. Yeah. Um, sometimes it takes a, a moment to kind of where do I where do I begin? I'll go ahead and um, and just kick kick things off. Do it. Tom. Um, I, I uh, first. I just I love the um, the example of the Wisconsin uh, you know data center. Um, I don't know. Show of hands. Show of virtual hands. Anybody know of that uh, uh, that data stream? I mean, it really demonstrates the hidden nature of some of these funded programs. And this is the part that, I mean, you, you just put your finger right on one of the kernels for this working group was um, I kept my ear to the ground and I was hearing little dribs and drabs from various colleagues. And I was like, gosh, you know, 
that that data set covers all of the Bay Area. Are, are we sure so and so knows about this? So thank you, thank you for, for that that resource, and we'll work to marry that with our um, with our with our Google uh, mm -hmm. uh, sheet, as you mentioned. But um, uh, this idea of data networks um, collecting data uh, pre-fire data without really without us really actually considering them as such. Can you give us another example of that so that we're more aware? And I'm thinking, of course, about the support that these data systems need. Well, and how we can... I think Allison might, Allison is representing the entity that to me has the best example, which was the fine scale veg mapping that Sonoma had done pre-fire. And, um, and she, she'd be able to comment on that more, better than me, I think. <laughs> But to me, that's a big one, because if that mm -hmm. hadn't occurred, there wouldn't have been the resources to evaluate the pre versus post fire condition, the canopy damage data, um, change in ladder fuels, some of those things, right? Indeed. Yeah. Allison, uh, Ag and Open Space really has done quite a bit, um, especially after the North Bay fires to uh, come back around and reevaluate some of the structural information and what um, if I may what what's some of the um, um, some of the best information that you guys have been able to um, uh, come back around and um, compare against the mm -hmm. original 2013 circa veg map Oh, I feel like there's just so much more work to be done in that realm and we're we're really looking forward to there being a LIDAR flight potentially in the next year or so funded through USGS and other partners and that'll really be our opportunity to update the ladder fuel data, update the fuel models working with Pepperwood Preserve and others to see um, really clearly how the landscape has changed. Again, Cher, we've done work and have been operating under some assumptions looking at post-fire canopy damage um, and looking at vegetation type and assuming what recovery may look like and what timeline and doing some groundwork, but where we have um, a real need for doing that change detection across all fire affected areas. And it's really the um, LIDAR data that can support that. We can do so much with imagery, but are really looking forward to getting our hands on, on those new data. So it's encouraging that looking across the Bay Area with there being um, more recent LIDAR acquisitions to be able to have that baseline and then procure funding and have momentum um, behind doing, you know, a five to seven year update, that would be amazing. Thank you. It's always, yeah. it's always difficult, like when you get asked, like, you know, why do we need X number of rain of uh, weather stations and X number of stream gauge stations and whatever. And, and um, these are, these are foundational kind of driving force tracking. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things I think I mentioned to you is the camera network being up on the ridge tops and adding both the camera network and meteorological data there has been really helpful for fire behavior modeling and calibrating models and wind and all these other factors related to that aspect. But complementing the, the stream network down in the canyons, adding meteorologic data there would also be a good step to better inform fire behavior modeling and help address some of the kind of local or mesoscale wind pattern issues and some of that would be useful to have a track of like, how is it happening regularly versus how is it happening during or after a fire? That would be spectacular. And, and I'm gonna talk about the streams because everybody wants to have somebody make a wise prediction of like, oh, is this stream gonna stay stable or is it gonna have a debris flow? Is it gonna flood, whatever. Well, <laughs> if we haven't been doing uh, pre-fire kind of assessments, we might not have a lot of information, even with good professional judgment, to make a, a, a guess on that. Now, USGS and California Geologic Society 
have launched some incredible research to try to update the data set about post-fire geologic stability for our region, which is terrific. But I would just say baseline data about the um, hill slopes, the stream corridors, the stream channels isn't that great. And I do believe it's, it is partly because we have so much private land and private access issues compared to some other regions. I believe that would be a priority um, if you ask me. Well, we are, and um, <laughs> we have um, on this call, you know, uh, folks from several mm -hmm. landowning uh, organizations, um, you know, Midpen and Post yeah. and yeah. some land trust and others. Um, I'm curious from the working group, uh, if any of your organizations are, well, um, actually have, have um, made this connection between uh, embedding gauges, whether they're you know just stream gauges or they're also weather um, data collectors, can, making that connection with the fact that those would actually be pre-fire uh data collectors and that they would serve that purpose i'm just curious if anybody has made that connection i'm just now making that connection thanks to you virginia well the cool part is often you're left needing to model uh you know start to do predictive modeling of well, what's the secondary hazard going to be and you're like the good news is the army corps of engineers has done a terrific job in the last couple of years with research from the Forest Service and others to improve some of the modules within HECRAS and HEC HMS. So there are post-fire related um, uh, tools now right inside those models. But if you don't have any data to calibrate, you, you might have to still have a fairly wide range of guests. And this is hard for communities if you think like, okay, the weather service is now saying for the next two to five years, you have an elevated danger in this canyon of debris flows. And um, I think uh, some of you may have been living in neighborhoods that had a big hazard sign on your road. And I'll tell you that real estate agents friggin' hate that. And that, um, you know, that is a problem for the community and also provides uncertainty where uh, there's a little bit of a, what do you call it, when you're crying wolf, where the public loses confidence in science when we have a little bit too much um, wiggle room in what we tell people. Mm -hmm. Now, we say, you know, we're doing the best we can, and who would predict that you'd go from fire to atmospheric river? Well, pretty much anybody who's been in California, actually, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but that kind of is our extreme of a fire followed by flood as a pattern. But, but that's what we're having to warn people about. And if we could be more accurate, that would help us in so many ways, right? So that's why some of those data would help us test a watershed model and, and then gain some confidence uh, in those model predictions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just wanna create a little space for any questions from the working group. I want to jump in real quick and say that your your graphics of um, your slides uh, with all the blobs <laughs> was really clarifying um, and how actually complicated and blobby it all is. Um, I think you used a different word than blob, but I, I really uh, that was really, really helpful to, to see the interconnections and how and how different agencies uh, are touching different parts of the system and but that from a land management perspective you're dealing right. with all of those correct systems and i i wonder um this may be rhetorical or maybe for the group now you know is it clear to leadership and organizational leadership as well as uh, elected leadership how how those different um Blobs Realms. and relate. Blobs. <laughs> um, and and I, I just I think that this the there's I'm gonna wildfire is so complex that I, I it just makes right. me think of the, trying to make that clear. So and thank I, you. Uh, I think 
I don't know. Did I just share that blob again? Yeah. It's okay. Good. Because um, I just want to point out that um, I appreciate that you found it useful because it was a struggle to try to express some of these things. But look just at the vegetation blob. I put a blob for vegetation. That means somebody's favorite special status plant species, somebody's timber property that they want to do commercial logging on, somebody's chaparral habitat, uh, uh, a vineyard, you know, it's, it's every kind of vegetation. It's the park. It's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's just like a very complicated blob of natural and working lands right there. And, um, and then, yeah, the, who cares about it? Who's in charge of it? Who's, who's mandated to know about it? Who, who is intrigued by it intellectually might not be who's mandated to take care of it or who owns it. So that creates like a real conundrum about who must gather data, who could gather data, you know, who should. I think there'd be a lot that could be um, improved. And I also want to say right this minute, I think I just got a news report that there's some evacuations happening in Boulder, Colorado. And some of my WRA colleagues, uh, we have a, several people right in that area. So um, it's, it's affecting everywhere and every time of the year and New Mexico is active right now. And um, we got a lot, a lot to try to solve. Indeed. Well, we just have a couple more minutes. If anybody wants to share uh, a question or an observation. Um, yeah, I had a question about getting access to the actual firefighting data. You know, where were people deployed? What did they do? Did it work or not? Mm. And, That's when I was you know, talking about the Snapchat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, because I just I have this idea that if we were able to document the mm -hmm. role that um, preserved, you know, conserved open space plays in effective firefighting, mm -hmm. we could really up its value in people's eyes. And just knowing how many times it was because they could freely maneuver in a place like Pepperwood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like we have anecdotes from all around the Bay Area, but to kind of get that all together, I think we'd see quite a compelling picture. Um, I think that there's, I mean, like I was mentioning, because there's big investment and therefore big scrutiny on the effectiveness of fuels treatments and some of these other things, I think there is starting to be a little more care taken to documenting day-to-day uh, -day operations. Um, and therefore, that then becomes a data set that can be analyzed. Now, who's, who gets access to analyze it? That part's still a little bit of a mystery to me because the post Caldor fire reporting about the Tahoe Basin, you know, there's, I don't know if I would call it yet third party objective review because it's Forest Service, the local fire uh, folks, and um, CAL FIRE who are commenting on the fuels treatments helped here or didn't or whatever. And um, I think it's something not my specialty, but something that different researchers should be making public information requests and trying to gather more data. You know, is it is it because we got everyone evacuated out of the way? Is that the main reason, it, you know, things went well? Was it the fuels treatments, the thinning? What combination? You know, there's unfortunately many data sets we have now. Mm -hmm. May I add a uh, point to your larger picture of, of blobs there? Sure. Uh, one is the Murphy's Law that there are going to be spots where they don't overlap. And there's little gaps, and that's where the next fire is going to be. <laughs> and uh, that seems to be the way things go. Um, the uh, and I don't recommend that as a fire predictive model, though. Um, <laughs> the other one is that with COVID and with a uh, plan power shutoffs or power shutoffs because of wind. Mm -hmm. The last couple fires, there was the difficulty that you explained so well 
of the kind of the circus of data swirling around, almost like that scene from Wizard of Oz where the cows in the house are going around. Each one of those is a different data set, and you're trying to grab them in this storm and pull them in. Uh, <clears throat> just being out there re working remotely or away from office, and then having network shut off and power system shut off and colleagues not being able to log in or having them evacuate. That's added a, I added a special spin, I think, into the last couple of fires, which uh, is important to realize that that casts a spin to those blobs or casts a, a way you can actually access those blobs, uh, yeah. especially because data becomes more services rather than sets you pull in, keep locally on your drive, right. that you're pulling them from different things that get shut off from you. Yep. Two things about what you just said before we close. One is you're absolutely right about the Murphy's Law part <laughs> uh, and, and about power because right before I was supposed to start screen sharing, my computer tells me I need an uh, update. <laughs> but um, the second one is, um, is that operational people doing the firefighting and emergency response and law enforcement, they have had a ton of after um, after uh, acts um, evaluations to change communication protocols, to prioritize protecting communication infrastructure, cell tower damages and all that as also a subset of wildfire damage that in real time has impaired response, right? So there's a whole nother set of folks trying to problem solve in that arena of technical or physical communication challenges. <laughs> Uh, it's it's tricky, yeah. I remember there's there was one situation where even going to that where they were using uh, unlimited data cell plans, and mm. suddenly being in the middle of going, okay, I got all I can eat data, mm. great, great, and finding their network being throttled, without which was against their original agreement with the phone company during mm. some of these events. That was right. a particularly troubling mm. uh, after effect that they had in Kavanaugh. And then my last point is just. There are so many incredible portals and dashboards and stuff, but to me, it's literally like, like a lot of static. And that's why I was hoping I could provide a little clarity on the, some of the primary uh, sources. Um, because as you visit different portals, you should start noticing, hey, this is just a way for me to get that GOES data. <laughs> or, you know, that it's going back to the original. And, and so just like old fashioned library research, if you can get back to primary. <laughs> so, and thanks a lot, Tom, for inviting me. Uh, it was a hectic uh, uh, effort to try to pull this together quickly, but I'm glad you uh, prompted me. Oh, it's, it's, um, it's our honor and, and pleasure um, and, and also our reward for your hard work to wrangle all these ideas. Truly thank you so much, Virginia.